This sermon is from the series entitled, Eyewitness Accounts, the Gospel of Luke, preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. It's interesting, isn't it, how people can watch the exact same thing and react very differently. Take, for instance, this World Cup match between Brazil and Chile. They are all eagerly anticipating what's going to happen in the goal kick. Any guesses on who won and who lost by that picture? Brazil obviously is ecstatic, and if you can't really see it, but the players of Chile are in tears behind. The same thing can happen, can't it, when an election happens. One party's happy, the other party isn't. It can happen when there's development. Amelia and I were driving around, and she's like, Dad, do you remember when we bought, when the which Crossway bought the church building? There was no Walmart, and there, all this stuff wasn't there. If you read the Facebook groups of Battleground, some people think that development is awesome, and others think that we just aren't that small, sleepy town anymore, and they hate it. You can go through whatever it is, and two people can go through the same thing and react very differently. Well, today, I raise that up because we are continuing to go through the book of Luke, and as Brian alluded to earlier in Um, when he was leading worship for us so well, that we are at the spot where we're going to talk about Jesus' crucifixion. And we are going to read through the whole crucifixion. If you recall, we actually read uh, in, in Lent, we did a series where we looked at the individual sayings on the cross in more depth, and you can definitely listen to those online if you want to. But today we're going to look at it as more of a big picture, the 30,000 foot view, the way that I would like to describe it and see people's different reactions to Jesus' crucifixion. And as I'm reading this, I want you to think about this, because I think that Luke sets it up in that way, where he has contrasting reactions. You will see that of every group, for one person who reacts this way, there's another person who reacts this way. And he highlights all of those in his narrative. And so if you want to turn with me in your Bibles, Luke 23 through 26 through 56 is what we will be reading. Uh, We read the NIV, but you can follow along in your own version, but the NIV is what we have here. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was put on his way from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Now a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned to them and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless woman, the wounds that never bore, and the breasts that never nurse. And then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For people do these things when the tree is green. What will happen when it dries? The other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, not a great nickname, They crucified him there along with criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And it was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. 
Now, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one which no one had been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The woman who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph, saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it, and then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath day in obedience to the commandment. Now, as I said, I mean, we could look at all the different chunks in their own spot. Um, there's definitely a lot to unpack, and we did in previous sermons earlier this year. So I want us to take more of a 30,000 foot view of this. And I think it's important for us to look at Jesus' words on the cross. We're going to also look at the miracles that were there and what they, they taught us about the work that was being accomplished. And then we're going to look briefly at people's different responses to Jesus and see how maybe we ourselves can, can look at it in our own life as well. Well, Jesus' words on the cross are pretty amazing if you think about it. If you look at them very closely, if there's a couple of words that I would use to describe them, it's merciful and compassionate and gracious. I mean, Jesus, as we've seen, has went through a trial where he had all kinds of false charges brought against him. He was beaten, and now he is hanging on a cross, which, as I said last week, is an incredibly terrible thing. I don't think that we can even imagine the amount of pain and suffering, physical suffering that he went through. But I think it's an amazing thing that Jesus' first words that he offers on that cross to the people that are literally mocking and insulting and doing everything they can to, to bash him and make fun of him is an offer of forgiveness. Very simply, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, if I was in that situation, I think there's plenty of other words I would say. Not all of them that kind. But it shows us the heartbeat of a Savior and the heartbeat of God who willfully endured all of this so that He could not just bring salvation to these folks and forgiveness to these folks, but to us as well. You know, it's easy sometimes for us to, to at least for me, to kind of look down upon all these people and say, like, you had Jesus in your midst. And you can't even see who he is when he's right there in front of him. How dare you mock him? How dare you make fun of him? How dare you, you do all of these different things? But Paul reminds us that you and I are in the exact same boat. That at one time, we were powerless. That we were ungodly. That we were still sinners as we read in our assurance of pardon today. But Jesus demonstrates his own love for us in this that He died for us in exactly that state. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so as we look at the story of His crucifixion, and as we hear these words of Jesus to the enemies that are there, let's remind ourselves that Jesus speaks those same words and an offer of forgiveness to you and to I. Because it's an important thing for us. It's easy for the devil to use those accusations against us and, and to say, hey, there's no way that God could love you. But in our passage today, we see that God is a God of forgiveness even to those when they work against Him. The, the next words that Jesus muttered in my mind are also as equally as powerful. You see, there's two criminals that were hung right next to Him. One, as we read, is mocking Jesus. And He is making fun of Him. Now, these criminals were not just petty thieves. They had to have been doing some pretty, pretty terrible things for them to be crucified. And, and the language that the Gospel writers use is that they are just downright thugs. Their, their rap sheet would be, have been pretty huge. And one of them is hurling insults at, at Jesus in that moment, but the other, the other sees something in the compassion of Jesus. Some, he sees his reaction to all that is going on and he says something very simple. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, that word is loaded. And if you want to see how loaded it is, go listen to the sermon that we dealt with it. It's a powerful passage. But I want you to see this, 
that there's an acknowledgement that Jesus is the King and that He wants to come into His eternal kingdom in just that kind of a statement. And that man who stood condemned and was going through his own set of excruciating pain, who wondered if Jesus understood that he was a sinner. I mean, that's what he says to the man. He goes, you and I deserve the punishment that we're getting, but this man doesn't. Gets some words that would be words of assurance and an invitation to paradise. Jesus says to him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And as I said in that sermon, I, I say often, paradise is just another word for heaven. In my mind, it's the, the term that Jesus uses for the kind of the intermediate state until the new heavens and the new earth come when Christ comes again. But this person who again knows he did not deserve grace, knows that he did not deserve mercy, sees that Jesus offers mercy to his enemies thinks that maybe, maybe Jesus could show him that kind of compassion too. And Jesus says to that man on his deathbed, in the middle of pain, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I want you to think about that assurance, what it would mean. I mean, I can't tell you how many times when I'm with people and as they know that death is coming near, knowing where they will go and who they will be with, that they will be with their Creator, that death is not the final story of their life, but rather eternity with Christ makes a huge difference in their lives. And so what we see here is that Jesus offers two powerful words, forgiveness to even His enemies and an invitation to paradise and the assurance that comes with it. But His final words that that Luke records, Jesus saying, is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. Now this is just as powerful of a statement. Because if you think about it, if you look at the chronological nature of the way that the Gospels work, just before this, he uttered, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, he felt the wrath and the pain and the suffering for for all the sins of the world. But when He's here, in this moment, after that, He highlights again that His relationship with God is not broken. That there is still a closeness there by using the words, Father. He didn't turn His back on God, even though God turned His back on Him temporarily so that He would face the punishment that you and I deserve. So we could come into His presence. But I want you to see too that it's also a bold declaration that God will deliver him from death. I told you that when we read through the call to worship to pay attention to those lyrics because Jesus quotes Psalm 31. I I don't know if you noticed it or not, but Jesus often quotes the Psalms twice here on, on the cross. Even my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is Psalm 24. And in this one, it's Psalm 31. And in it, he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, my faithful God. He quotes that when he says his phrase here. And what that is, is a declaration that he knows that he will get final deliverance and God will save him, not in the sense that he saves you and I, but rather that he will help him defeat the enemies of sin and death once and for all. And so when Jesus utters these words, Father, into Your hands I commit my spirit. He's portraying the whole side of the psalm, which is really, yes, I am the righteous one. And that's what we read even in the beginning, the first verses of it. And I have all this trouble and all these enemies around me, but I trust that You will deliver me, that You will bring the redemption that You promised. And so what we know when Jesus utters these words is one, that his relationship with the Father is connected, but two, that that deliverance that he's talked about, that promise that he's had, is going to come to fruition, and we will see that it actually does when we read next week about the resurrection from the dead. But not only that, it means that those words that he spoke to the thief about how today we can be in paradise with him also reign true for us. That whether Christ comes back again or we die, whatever happens first, we do not need to fear it because we know that Jesus and God the Father have acted in a way to defeat sin and death and bring deliverance to us. 
Those are powerful words that Jesus had spoken, and I think that they, like I said, could be looked at much more in depth. But I think it's amazing how Luke not only highlights these powerful words, but he, in just one verse, says some pretty powerful things about the two miracles that I think highlight the work that Jesus has accomplished. It's right there in Luke 23, verse 44 and 45. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. So easy just to move past that and ignore it, but what it says here is that the descent of darkness came at noon. That's important. It wasn't just, you know, a couple of clouds blocking up the sky. There was a deep darkness that came over the, the, this situation where Jesus was hanging on the cross on His moments right there. Now, I think we all know that darkness is an image of sadness. We, we, some of us, if we're in the sad spot, if we're in a dress, depressed state, we'll say things like, life's pretty dark right now. But darkness also in the Bible is it shows is it, an image of the wrath of God. Zephaniah 1 verse 15 says, that day will be a day of wrath, wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. And Luke highlights it because he wants us to see that when Christ was on that cross and He cried out, my God, my God, why have You forsaken Me? Which is recorded in Matthew and also in Mark, that there was spiritual darkness there as well as physical darkness. Because Jesus was taking on the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins, even though He didn't deserve it as we saw last week. And, and that darkness that was happening there, the physical darkness, was giving the people there a sign and a symbol of what was happening in Jesus right there. It should have awakened their eyes that this man who claimed to be the Messiah is now the darkness comes, that God's prophecy had come to fulfillment. But again, the people didn't necessarily always get it. But he did a second miracle to make sure that that was done, and that is the tearing of the veil that showed that in the temple. Again, Luke says it so briefly. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, if you read in other accounts, I think it's Matthew and Mark, they make it absolutely clear that the temple was torn from the top down. Now, we have to go back and look at some of the examples of what the temple was like. We need to remember that it's in the middle of the Passover season, right in the middle of the Passover festival, and the, it would have, the temple would have been packed. The priests would have been working nonstop to slaughter and prepare the lambs for the Passover meal and do everything that was there. And so there were priests in the the holy place, which was only allowed by the, the priests were allowed to go after making all these different sacrifices. And if you remember, inside of that, there was a special place where the Ark of the Covenant that symbolized God's presence was there. And there was this huge, immaculate curtain that separated the two. And only one priest could go behind there on the Day of Atonement, and he would make a sacrifice there. And, and, and even he tore a, a, a rope around his ankle because he was so afraid that if the, the, the smoke wasn't enough, that he would see the presence of that Ark of the Covenant and the, the presence of God, that they would die and no one else would want to go in there so they would have to pull the rope. Now, I don't know of anybody happening, but they did that because they had such a fear of coming into the presence of that place. And it's noted even in the Jewish Talmud that this curtain, which was 30 feet by 30 feet and some think an inch thick, so it wasn't that somebody could just, you know, rip it. Somebody would have had to climb up a ladder and take a sword at it and chop it and do that. And if anybody even brought anything like that, they would have been taken out because the people would have feared. But miraculously, on its own, the curtain was destroyed from the top to the bottom. And the, the miracle of this is it shows that that separation from a holy God to a sinful person could be removed. And that God did it Himself. It came from the top to the bottom. And it just highlights what Jesus has taught us for a while, which says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. And so Luke records this miracle to show us 
that now, even though we are still sinful people, we have the ultimate sacrifice and can come into the presence of God and we can treasure the fact that we are His children. And so there is the darkness, but that darkness produced the tearing of the curtain, which meant we can come into the presence of God. Well, how did the people react to these things? These words of mercy, these words of grace, these assurance of pardon, uh, uh, of, uh, that they would be in paradise and this trust of God. How did they, they react to these signs and symbols that they should have seen that God was at work, that His prophecy was coming into fulfillment? Well, Luke records two different responses. Two different responses. Unfortunately, most ridiculed Jesus for not saving Himself. In their mind, if you're truly the Messiah or a kingly figure that you claim to be, then you should be able to save yourself. And so they had the religious leaders who made fun of Him for His messianic claims. If you recall, in Luke 22, that was the charge. They said, if you're the Messiah, and Jesus says, if I said, you wouldn't even believe Me. And they said, well, there you go. The charges are brought forth. We don't even say anything more. He is claiming to be that messianic figure and He deserves death for it. They make fun of Him for the, being that messianic, the Savior claims, because in their mind, the Savior would save Himself and all the people. They got it wrong. And then there's the Roman soldiers who mocked His regal claims. If you remember, Pilate said, are you the King of the Jews? And that was Jesus' way of acknowledging that He was the King, the kingly person of the line of David that had been prophesied to bring about the salvation of His people. And he had that title written above his cross. And the Roman soldiers say, well, if you're really such a great king, then you should have some might and you should at least be able to tell some people to bring you down and save yourself. And then as we've highlighted, there's the criminal who insulted Jesus. But this criminal takes a different angle. He doesn't mock his claims. Well, he does, the Messiah. But he says, if you truly are who you claim to be, then don't just save yourself, save me. He says, I'm only going to believe in you if you do something for me. Now again, I don't know about you, but it's easy to look at these characters and say, how dare you? But if I'm honest, there's a little bit more of the heart of that first thief than I would care to admit. Sometimes I can kind of want to God to be my cosmic Santa Claus. Like, Lord, you know, I, I, I really need you to do this, and I'd really show you love and devotion if you do this for me. But really what that is, is trying to put constraints on God. It's okay to ask Him to work in your life. But the question is, are you going to trust in Him for what He did on the cross, or only if He blesses you with the way that you think you need to be blessed? That's the mindset of the criminal. I'll only believe in you. I'll only accept the forgiveness that He muttered, the par being in paradise, if you do what you want me to do, I want you to do in this moment. Well, if I look at it in that way, maybe there's a little bit more of the heart there, of my own heart than I care to admit. But there's others who showed faith in Christ. And Luke records four different groups. Now the first one is the women. I mean, His disciples ditched Him, but the women who had been following Jesus as well are shown being with Him even in His final moments. It says the women who mourned and wailed behind him in Luke 22, and then it says the women who had come from with Jesus from Galilee, that they followed. They were there at the foot of the cross, and they followed him all the way to the tomb. They showed their devotion to Jesus in a powerful way. They showed a love that even surpasses what we see the disciples doing, the apostles doing. We also see another criminal. As I said, there's. In Luke's Gospel, there's two. There's a contrast here. One criminal who mocks Jesus and will only put faith in Him if He acts in the way that He wants them to. And the other criminal who submits to Jesus' divine rule. Jesus, He says simply, Jesus, remember Me when You come into My kingdom. And as we said earlier, He admits His brokenness. He says, I deserve the punishment I get. I'm a criminal. This thing on the cross is what I deserve, but this man doesn't. And then he says, Lord, let me come into your kingdom. And in that little statement, as I said earlier, there's a powerful thing. 
He may not have fully grasped what Jesus was going and doing and accomplishing on that cross, but God put inside of him the spark to cry out to him and ask for forgiveness and in entering into the kingdom. And when he admitted his faults and when he admitted Christ's kingly rule, Jesus says, come and be with me. Surely you'll be with me in paradise. And then there's the Roman centurion. Many of the soldiers mocked him. Again, they, they made fun of his, of his kingly title, the king of the Jews. But Luke records one centurion who had probably seen crucifixion after crucifixion after crucifixion because he would have been on the hit squad who when he saw the darkness and he heard of the, the symbol and he heard God's words of compassion and mercy to his enemies, of forgiveness, and an offer to be with him forever, and that trust of God, something stirred inside the centurion where he understood that this man was righteous. This man was righteous man and didn't deserve this death. And then there was Joseph of Arimathea, who Luke records in just very quickly, hey, he didn't agree with the decision that the Sanhedrin had made. And even though he was part of them, he put himself at great risk going to Pilate and saying that he could put Jesus in his tomb. This religious leader went against the trend of all the other religious leaders. And even in Jesus' final moment, in his death, he showed a devotion to him. He didn't leave his body there. He, he didn't leave it to a spot where he'd be treated like a criminal or a beggar. He allowed and consented, got with Pilate's permission to be treated in a tomb, which was the place that wealthy people could afford. And he took it down, and with care and compassion, he wrapped Jesus' body in a linen cloth and placed it in the tomb cut by a rock. So we see that in even Jesus' death, there's these two reactions. There's the reaction of mocking. There's the reaction of, I will only put trust in you if you do something for me. There's a mock of God's plan and a doubt of whether or not He truly was the Savior. And then Luke records the other reaction, a reaction of faith. A faith of a thief. A faith of a Roman centurion. And even the faith of a Jewish leader. And I think Luke does that. He highlights all of these things because he wants to, us to see that no matter, one, that Jesus works in the lives of all kinds of different people. Not just good people who have their life all figured out or certain people from an economic status or a certain kind of a background. No, he worked in the heart of a religious leader. He worked in the heart of common people. He worked in the heart of even the most hard-hearted Gentile who who shouldn't have even had any faith in a Jew at all, in a Jewish person at all. But yet God worked in their life and put faith in their life. And that leads us to the question that we all have to wrestle with, and that is this. What is our response to Jesus' crucifixion? What is our response to it? Do we mock His saving claims? Do we claim that it's just a man-made story? for forgiveness? Do we believe in God when He does something only for us and when life is good, well then He's trustworthy? Or do we accept the free gift that He gives us? Do we accept the gift that He offers us? The mercy. Father, forgive us for they know not what they're doing. The invitation to paradise. And are we willing to give up and to risk things like even Joseph of of Arimathea had to in a very public way. What is our response to Jesus? Is it scoffing? Is it mocking? Is it conditions? Or is it admitting our brokenness before the Lord and submitting to His rule over our lives and accepting His mercy and grace? Let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m., at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.